Have you guys ever had an un unexpected visitor in your life before? Have you? That's not a reference to me being here as a guest speaker, you know. <laughs> but have you? Have you ever been doing something uh, and then all of a sudden someone sees you or, or, or you're caught red-handed in something? Or, you know, hey, good or bad, you know? It seemed like you can remember the times when it's bad, you know? You were in the aisle that you shouldn't have been and then all of a sudden, oh, uh, I, I was just passing next aisle, you know, whatever it is, fill in the blank. We weren't doing something that we shouldn't have been doing, but we did get an unexpected visitor on Monday. A few of us, a few of us guys went out, at, you know, as any responsible uh, firearm owner would. We trained. Uh, we we got we took a class. We took a professional, a solid class, some group movement stuff and all that. Uh, again, responsible, the whole nine yards and all that stuff. Uh, the instructor lived in, I think he lived in Olympia, Washington and said, I'll meet you at 7 a.m. in the parking lot of this Hagen's, you know, so 7 a.m. means 5 a.m. here, you know, drive up and, you know, do the thing. And then we go, the, the quarry where we were going to take the class was like 30 minutes outside of the city. Uh, so it's, it's the middle of nowhere, the middle of the middle of nowhere, you know what I mean? So like as we're driving out to the middle of nowhere, it becomes less like houses and more like domiciles, you know what I'm saying? Like a lot more tarps covering things, you know? So, so we're, we're, you know what I'm saying. You guys from Grants Pass know exactly what I'm talking about. GP. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's getting a little more, you know, roll of the dice, whatever. but then it starts becoming less and less areas of people living in more like nothing. And then, you know, you take a right on a gravel road and drive six, seven, eight miles, just nothing. 20 minutes on this winding road, up, 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 up. And it's cold, it's snow on the ground. At the end, there's probably six inches of snow on the ground. And so we're at around eight o'clock a.m. We get out, start training paper, and then go to steel and all that, it's great. Um, and it, it's really cold, and it's, it's about 35 degrees outside, six inches of snow, and it's raining and all that stuff. So we're kind of you know, ready to take lunch. It's 11.30, so there's eight, eight of us uh, people from Athey Creek, a couple of us pastors, you know, uh, a couple security guys and all that stuff. Uh, two trucks, my truck and Dan's truck. Dan's truck will come into play in a second. Um, <laughs> don't worry, you know, nothing bad happens. Uh, maybe. Uh, and, then, and then the instructor's truck and his right-hand guy. So three trucks. So we uh, uh, take off like our chest rig and belts and all that stuff and uh, turn on the trucks. We all get in our truck, you know, and in my truck with me, John, Jacob, and uh, uh, Thomas, you know, a couple of us, and then Dan's truck, three other guys, and then the instructor's truck. So we're taking lunch, snow outside, really cold. And we're talking, you know, uh, and then out of the peripheral vision over here, I see someone walking up. And, and there's a little bit of like an unspoken rule with, you know, let's just say firearms, right? If someone's doing their thing over here, you don't really come in on their thing. You know what I mean? There's, this, is, this might be a guy thing in general. Like there's certain like unspoken guy rules. Like if it's a couch, how many people can you sit on a couch? Hey, some of y'all answer that pretty different. You know what I'm saying? Girls would say, you know, we can get four of us. Guys, it's like two hard times. You know what I'm saying? There's some of those unspoken. One is, one should be the, you know, There's a little bit of the un unspoken rule. And let me just say that approaching so this is like a bit of a no-no, all right? You know, or in general, it's a big, it's the big middle of nowhere and you're walking up to, to our rig, all right? What's, what's going on? So it's, all, it's already a little bit concerning if, if, you, if you've been in this situation. But as I look over and I see him, lo and behold, I see not just someone, but it's a guy, it's in the snow, he's wearing sweatpants, tennis shoes, and like a athletic, uh, like from probably from the 90s, like sport jacket and a floppy hat and a machete <laughs> on his back. John Slaughter, true or false? Very true. Okay. <laughs> this is Monday, right? I actually didn't tell Ken. I don't think I told you about this. 
Oh, for a good reason. So guy with a machete comes up to our door. And so I see him and, you know, you guys could, you know, sweat. Starting to, and then he, 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 he approached me 10 feet and then I, I rolled down the window just a little bit, you know, because there's some reasons, you know. <laughs> hey, can I help you? You know, it's kind of like kind of with a smile, but very assertive, you know. And then he started, hey, he actually was kind of like going like that, like walking up kind of like this. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so he's like, I need some help. I got my car stuck up, up the road a little bit. And I need, some, I need some help getting my car out. Now, when he's talking, I, I noticed that there were a few chicklets missing. <laughs> There's some teeth. Like, poor guy. Like, he, he'd, he'd been through it. The situation was, was, was not good. Let's just say that. He had a goatee that was like, like in these three lines kind of deal. Um, a, a lot of things pointed to, you know, roll up the window quick, you know. <laughs> but I'm with these pastors. <laughs> and so I said, hey, we'll be with you in just a sec, man. Up, up the road this way. So, yeah. So one thing I didn't tell you about Dan's truck is Dan's truck is a awesome, I think 2004 uh, F-350 that says search and rescue on the side. So that right there is like checkmate. You got to help the guy that's stuck. <laughs> search and rescue. Now, my truck didn't say search and rescue. Dan's truck said search and rescue. So then the guy kind of, you know, hobbles off. Uh, and then I waited a little bit and I get out and I, hey, Dan. So this guy, he's like, what was that about? The guy said his car is stuck up there. Should we go? Should we not? And he's like, Let's do it. Like he was a little too stoked to help this guy out, which is great. Like Dan's ready to go, search and rescue, you know. So we go up the road and, and sure enough, his probably 2001 Saturn is in the, hey, it was a good company, you know, rest in peace. Uh, his Saturn is, is in the ditch, in the snow. And he said he burnt out his clutch or something. And then he said, he's like, uh, then we were like, okay, so what are you going to do once we get you out? Like, you, you can't drive it. And he's like, he said, he's like, okay, it's on a hill, right? Understood. It's on a hill. And he's stuck at the top of the hill. <laughs> in the ditch at the top of the hill. And so he said, I think he said, he said, I got down. I can get back up, which was kind of opposite. <laughs> so we're all like, okay, all right, man, you got it. So Dan, he hooks up the, the cave and get him, get him going. And then he just kind of coasts off. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Nothing happened. But then a couple hours later, a totally different guy, uh, uh, again, like there's, you know, eight of us plus a couple of instructors doing our thing. Um, he, he, again, another guy walks up to us, tattoos on his face. A lot of them, like, like picture like the Mike Tyson tattoo times 10. <laughs> and then two gauges, two gauges on his lip, one right here and the other right here. And then it looked like he had a huge dip in his mouth, but I think it was like a body mutilation thing, right? Like, a, like tobacco, I thought he had tobacco or some sort of uh, uh, plastic insertion in his lip. So look at that, right? He's like, when are you guys gonna be done? <laughs> like couple hours, man, you know, and then he walked away too. Unexpected visitors. The moral of the story is don't go to Washington. <laughs> Y'all thought it was bad in Portland. I mean, wait till you get to that Olympia, you know what I'm saying? You know. <laughs> Unexpected visitors. The machete guy. Here in one of the most amazing Old Testament stories, we have something like that, some unexpected visitors. What's the situation? We have Abraham, who just was visited by the Lord and two angels. And there he was told two things. One, you and Sarah, you're gonna have a kid in a year. Next year, kid's gonna be in your arms. It's gonna be awesome. The other thing is, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going down. And then Abraham begins the bartering system that you guys might know. He's like, Lord, surely don't, don't destroy this city. You, there's righteous people in this city. And as you guys may or may not know, Lot 
Abraham's nephew. And Lot's family was in the city of Sodom. So Abraham's like, Lord, please don't destroy this city. If there's 50 righteous people, Lord, will you destroy this city? And the Lord said, no, I won't. And the, Abraham probably thinking, you know, 50 is a pretty big number for Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, what about 40? If there's 40 people, will you destroy the city? And then God said, no. Abraham got to thinking, yeah, 40 is a pretty big number. Okay, what about 30? What about 25? What about 10? And the Lord said, no, if there are 10 righteous people, I won't destroy the city. And on and on it goes. But lo and behold, it goes down, which is where we get the start of chapter 19. And then two angels came to Sodom at the evening time. And Lot, he sat at the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, the two angels, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, behold, now, my Lord, turn in. I pray unto you, into your servant's house, come into my house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you'll rise up early and you'll go on your way. And they said, nay, they weren't horsing around. They said, no way. We're not going in your house, but we're going to abide in the street all night. So we have the two angels make their way downtown without the Lord. Do you guys, do you guys note that, right? There were three angels. There was the Lord and these two angels with Abraham. And then in the next verse in, from 33, uh, uh, Genesis 18, 33, there's the Lord went his way. The Lord left. And then the two angels went. Why is that? The Lord will not be near to that sin. If you are find yourself in sin, the Lord is not going to uh, be near to you. In Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's a tough, that's a tough thing to, to think about. Pardon me, I'm getting ahead of myself on slides. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So what iniquity are we finding here in Sodom and Gomorrah? The city is full of sin, sexual immorality, and everything else you can think of in between. Specifically, we'll get into it, that of the sexual immorality stuff. But where do we see Lot? Do we see him in a place where he is uh, preaching the gospel on the streets? Do we see him in a spot where he, he started a, a multi-site, uh, a watch party? No, uh, we see quite the opposite. We see that he is in the gate of Sodom. Now in the gate of Sodom, as depicted at, by my slides that you'll see in a moment, <laughs> in the gate meant a spot of council. It wasn't just like you were hanging out in the city uh, in, in the walls of the city. It could have been that, but it was more specific that you were in a spot of council. Maybe even think about it as in like, you were the person that decided who got into the city and who didn't get into the city, right? You were in a spot of, of like an exalted spot in the city. And here, this is kind of cool. This is, this is the gates of Dan. We go here on our Israel trip. The Israel trips that we've gone on, we've been here before. How many of you guys have been to Dan with us in Israel? It's pretty cool. This is the gate of the city. And if you see these steps here, uh, that is likely where leaders, prominent figures, uh, maybe even judges would sit and determine whether or not someone could come into the city, someone could trade in the city or, or whatever it may have been. Lot found himself in a spot where he was leading the charge. He was leading the charge of this city that, that the Lord said is wicked. It is evil. And that should have been a, a check. That should have been something where it's like, man, this isn't good. If you find yourself with the world saying, you know, you're the man, we love you, we support you, we look to you, that might not be such a good thing. You know what I mean? So if you, if you find yourself in, in Portland where, man, this guy has all the, the coolest sayings, he does all the coolest things, she wears all the coolest clothes, 
you're chasing after the world and what the world brings. And that's gonna lead you into places like the gates of, of Sodom. Pretty scary. And he, he knows. So when the angels say, hey, we're not gonna hang out with you. We're gonna go into the city. And Lot says, no, 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 come over here. Wait, hold on. You know, if you guys remember when you were kids, you know, like if you broke a, a vase or a cookie jar or whatever, uh, you, you had a lot of creativity as far as like mom, dad, not going in that room, that place, whatever it was. Hey, mom, no, I, th- I think there's something wrong. Not in that room, you know, <laughs> got to go over there where it's not. Lot pulls one of those, right? Where he's like, no, 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 turn in, in verse two. Come over here. Let's go over here. In verse three, and he pressed upon them greatly saying, please, please enter into my house. And they turned into him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they did eat. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and the young, and all people from every quarter. So that is the whole city hears of these guys, these two angels who had a, the presence of the Lord, something clearly special about them. Two things, enough for a lot to recognize those are angels of the Lord. But then also enough for the, the entire city word to get out to the old, to the young, to the people from over there, to the people over here. They all came together and what did they say? In verse five, they called unto Lot and said, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us. Bring them out that we may know them. The idea there is not to get acquainted, it's rape. The men, the young, the old, they wanted to rape these men. And when Lot went out to the door unto them, he shut the door behind him. He's like, I'm gonna go do a little bit of business here. Shuts the door behind him. And what does Lot say? He says... I pray to you, brethren. Brethren? Bros? Lot is, is reasoning with these guys. Like, hey guys, come on. You, I know you. You know me. We're bros, is what he's saying. Do you guys see any problem with that? Yeah. A couple chapters earlier, we found a guy, Lot, who was committed to following Abraham. That's why he left where he was at right? To go with Abraham, if you know the story, to go with Abraham on the spiritual pilgrimage, right? That Abraham went on. Lot's like, dude, I'm going with you, which is awesome. Very commendable. And it all started when he lifted up his eyes, the Bible said, and saw the green pastures, the bounty that was in Sodom. And he went there. He went after it. Is that something that you guys have in your life? Is there something in the world that The Lord's called you to the right, but over on the left, it looks pretty good. The popular table, the good business deal, the new curriculum, whatever it may be. Is there something over there that is leading you astray from what the Lord has for you? That is the case for Lot here in this Bible story, where Lot led not just him, but Lot led his whole family down into Sodom and Gomorrah and was just corrupt by them. So it says, bros, do not so wickedly. Verse eight, behold, I have two daughters which have not known a man, they're virgins. Let me, I pray to you, bring them out to you and, and do ye as it is good in, in your eyes. Here, don't, don't take these two angels. Take and rape my two virgin daughters. Only unto these men do nothing. Don't do anything to these angels. For therefore, they came under the shadow of my roof. Now, I've looked a little bit, not too much, but there's a few commentaries that I've looked at where they're saying, uh, this is not like some cultural thing that Lot was trying to um, go through, right? Like there is that in the Middle East, don't get me wrong, as far as like, if you're a visitor and you visit someone's tent, the hospitality is, is amazing. It's awesome. Right? Like when you come into someone's tent and they're like, oh, come in, let me feed you. Let me give you this coat and here have my dog or whatever. You're like, whoa, dude, like I'm just passing through. Hospitality is very high, but there is, there is no 
obviously moral, but definitely no cultural reason for this to happen. So why is this happening? Why does Lot reason in his mind, you know, hey, don't have these two angels, these two men, these two angels, take my two daughters and have them do what you will with them. The fog of sin. As we get closer and closer to sin, we get further away from God. As we get closer to listening to our flesh, the part of us that, that, is evil, is wicked, is sinful, the farther we are from being able to hear the Lord. Again, in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear you. The Lord can speak to you, big megaphone, but when you're deep going in your own way, you'll make decisions like this, crazy decisions that you offer your two daughters to the world. I wonder if there's something there as well. You fathers, you mothers, are you offering your kids to the world in a way that is because of the life choices that you've made, where you've chosen to move, the job that you've chosen to have, the, the, the parenting strategies that you've, you've chosen to enact. Lot, he had it going on. And then he moved, took the job in the gate. And what happened? His whole family is about to be wrecked. In verse nine, and the men, they all said, stand back. The two angels said, stand back. (laughs) And they said again, this one fellow came to sojourn and he needs to be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them, say the men of the city, right? The men of the city said, hey, once we're done with those two angels, we're gonna get you. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and then came near to breaking the door. It's kind of like a, like a, like a Black Friday at Walmart, you know? Have you guys seen that, right? Like people that die at Walmart because of the Black Friday sales and they push in, right? Get trampled. You guys not seen that? Who has seen that? Yeah. This is like that, but because they want sin, not a good deal, right? You know what I'm saying? Crazy. And they, and then but the men put forth their hand. Now the two angels, they put forth their hand. They pulled Lot into the house to them and then they shut the door behind him. And then the angels, they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were wearied themselves to find the door. These angels, they smite him with blindness, all of them. But not only do they smite him with blindness, the the immorality of these people, the twisted hearts of these people, you'd think that if you're blind, you'd probably stop doing what you're doing, right? Not so with these guys. They continue on. They press even harder. It said that they wearied themselves to find the door after they're blind. This city, this city is messed up. One good comparison is specifically as it regards to sexual immorality, What's an issue where we're plagued with blindness, but we continue to move on? One example is STDs, HIVs, all that stuff. It, it is of note. It's interesting. It's a heavy topic. But it's interesting that, that that typically doesn't stop someone, right? A lot of times people continue on. They press in. They press through. They go. They dig in deeper into the sins that they want to do, the flesh, Right? Even though the Lord smites them with blindness, they continue on, they press, they press. Verse 12, and the men said unto Lot, hast thou there any besides thee, a son-in-law, thy sons and thy daughters? The angels are trying to, trying to say, okay, who else is with you? What kind of family do you have? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Was it Billy Graham who said that if the Lord doesn't judge, is it San Francisco? Then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Portland's right, we're right there. You know, 
People are put, they're blind, but they are pushing onto the door. It's an interesting thing to think about. You know, in, in, in the Bible in the New Testament says several times, Jesus says several times that it'll be as the days of Lot. We're in those days. The machete guys. That's crazy. There was like a darkness about that kind of thing that we didn't really even need to address. It was kind of like, there's something else going on here that's very sad. Um, and that's everywhere. Just go downtown. Look for a second. Don't go downtown. Blindness. But they're pushing. Verse 14. And Lot went out and he spake unto his sons-in-law. So, so there's some math you got to do here, right? He has the two virgin daughters. And then he has, it doesn't say how many, but multiple sons-in-law, right? Which means he had what? At least two more daughters. You guys agree with that? So he went out spake to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. So what's happening here? Lot can't minister to his family is what's happening. They think he's crazy. You're crazy. I don't even believe you. You're nuts. That's not going to happen. Pops. Lot, how would you sound to your relatives? Would you sound crazy if you're like, if, if you guys don't believe in Jesus as your personal savior, then you're going to go to hell. They'd, they'd think you're crazy. Paul, uh, pardon me, Lot here, his credibility as far as saying, we got to get out of here is so low in that his investment in the city was so high. He was a leader in the city. He was leading the charge. And then all of a sudden to say, no, wait, stop, get out, right? It would take a long time before people would be like, okay, maybe, maybe you, you have something there. You know, it's maybe let's say the drug addict. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, you, you know a history of whatever it may be of, of, of man, this is it's not good, not good, not good, not good. And then all of a sudden the, the light switch flips and then, then a, something good, a good action, whatever it may be, a word of truth, whatever it is, you'd be like, okay, what's up? Like, what's the catch? You know, it would take a long time before trust was rebuilt. Do you guys agree with that? Lot is in a similar point here where he has invested highly in the city of Sodom. And at the detriment of his family, they don't take him seriously. In verse 15, when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot saying, arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, now, if two angels are saying, hey, you gotta go, are you gonna linger? No way. If they, if they just cast blindness on a huge crowd of people, you're going to do what they say and do it really, really quickly, right? You know what I'm saying? And while he lingered, the men laid hold on his hand, laid hold upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city, outside of the city. The Lord will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Now you're saying righteous. Who's righteous in this story? Well, technically Lot, right? Where do we know that? The book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 in what's called the hall of faith. He's called righteous Lot simply because he believed on the Lord. And that should be something that is encouraging to you and me. If Lot and all the things that he's done, all the things that he's doing in this story, if he is considered righteous because he believed in the Lord, we're good to go. We have the Holy Spirit with us. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. The Lord will not destroy 
the righteous with the wicked. So he takes them, takes them out of the city and sets them ready to go. And it came to pass in verse 17, when they brought them forth, when the angels brought them forth abroad, he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Now, if you're looking for like a, a, a couple point sermon, right here, baby, this is it. This is what you need. You know, point number one, escape for thy life, right? If you're in Sodom and Gomorrah, if you are in a spot right now, uh, a, a relationship, a friend group, a, a business deal, a school situation, a sports team, whatever it may be, if you are in a spot where you are being compromised morally, escape for your life. Take it seriously. This is where this kind of stuff ends up. Sin ends up taking your life in some way or another, it will. Whether that's physically, literally, or, or, or spiritually, or uh, a number of ways. Escape for your life, point number one. Look not behind you. Don't look back at the things that you once did, right? Uh, 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 whether you're, you're, it's, it's drugs, whether it's sex, whether it's alcohol, whether it's uh, gossip. Don't look behind the things that you've done. It's gonna look good, but don't look, don't even look. Don't even look behind you. And then it says in that second part, neither stay thou in the plain. Don't stick around where you know bad things are going down. Take the different street, right? If you know that one street, there's that one store where you, you, it's just a quick stop. Get in, get out, you know? No, no, no. Take the long way around. It's worth, don't even stay in the plane. And then escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed. What mountain? The rock. Christ is our rock. There's a ton of mountains in the Bible. And it, it, it could be a whole independent study, right? Uh, uh, whether you're talking about Mount Sinai and what that means, whether you're talking about obviously the one, Calvary. There's, there's tons of mountains, tons of significance in the Bible. This could be a, a cool study in and of itself. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So we got to run to the rock. And verse 18, and Lot said unto them, oh, not so, my Lord. <laughs> are you kidding me? Come on, Lot. Are you, are you getting it? These guys grabbed you, picked you up out of the city, smote the guy with blindness and said, you got to go. And he's like, wait, wait, hold on. Say it's not so. That's where Weezer got the thing. Say it ain't so. <laughs> Verse 19, behold, says Lot, behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and I die. The reference there is probably he's saying like bears or, or, or lions or whatever it may be. There could be animals out there. I can't get there. I can't get to the mountain. So what does he say? Verse 20, behold now the city, this little city is near unto me and it is a little one is what it says. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. There's always a reason for you not to go to the mountain, so to speak. Do you guys know what I mean by that? It's not gonna be a good reason, but there's always gonna be a snooze button in the morning. You know what I mean? There's always gonna be that one friend that hits you with a text that is an invite to do something. There's always gonna be that, that, that advertisement Dude, and they're getting good with those advertisements. You know what I mean? Like you're doing good and all of a sudden, bam, something hits you. Like, okay, whoa. There's always a reason to take a detour or whatever it is. And Lot, he says, no, no, no. I, I don't want to go into the middle of nowhere. I'll just go into a little bit of a city. It's like, a, like a, we're witnessing a relapse kind of deal, right? An addict, someone who's addicted to whatever it is he's addicted to. We call it sin, and he's got a problem. He said, can I just go to this little city? Verse 21, and then he responds saying, see, I have accepted thy concern in this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for thou which thou hast spoken. 
Haste thee, escape hither, for I cannot do anything till thou become, thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little one. So Lot gets his way, kind of, and gets to go to this little baby city because the Lord's like, hey, you get your way. I'm not gonna destroy the city with you in it. So get on out, go to your city. And then in verse 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain. Remember that, stay not in the plain, right? And all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. The area that we're at is the Dead Sea. Today, that's what it's called, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Lot. And do you guys know why they call it the Dead Sea? Because ain't nothing lives there. Nothing lives there. Again, how many of you guys have been to the Dead Sea? Raise your hand. It's, it's an interesting spot because it's beautiful. Like this picture is, is kind of beautiful, right? For about 20 minutes, right? Where you're like, man, this is cool. But you can't do anything there. It, during certain times of the year, because of the high salt content, uh, uh, if, you, if you slap the water really, really hard, you can get micro abrasions on your hand because of how salty the water is. You go, when you, even in like low salt content times of the year, based on how high and low the Dead Sea is, uh, you, you walk in and instantly, like your cuticles, like in your, on your toes or whatever, are just like, they kind of like, like sting a little bit. It's a, it's a really weird experience. The salt content is, is just, it's, it's amazingly high. Let's just say that. In fact, these, the white, uh, what look like ripples on like, like mud, that's salt. That's salt. There's whole entire, spoiler alert, pillars of salt <laughs> that are in the middle, that are just, are, are just hanging out there. Like it's a really weird spot. And it's, it's beautiful, kinda. Like the way that the Sahara Desert is beautiful. It's like, man, this is, this is really cool. I don't wanna be here <laughs> for more than 10 minutes. I'm going back to the hotel. But in verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him. And the idea of looking back, it isn't just like looking and like checking it out, like, whoa, fire and brimstone. The idea is to look back longingly, to be bummed that your pet sin is being destroyed, you know? That's, that's true uh, corruption, right? If you guys have ever had any sort of like hard talk or addressing sin or something like that, there, there is a really, really cool relief that I believe that God built into the whole process, right? Like when you're a kid, and you got a spanking or something like that, the, the moments after that are very tender. You know what I mean? They're kind of like, okay, I was wrong, you know, whatever it may have been. As an adult, to be able to uh, uh, cut up that thing, to burn that sin, to, to leave that, that relationship, to send that text or whatever, to get out, to escape for your life, to not even stay in the plane, to run to the mountain, whew, that feels pretty good. You know what I mean? Not easy, but it can feel pretty good. It's a corrupt person that does all that stuff and says, oh, but I wish I could still be over there. That's the flesh. We all have that a little bit. Don't get me wrong. That thing can come back for sure. But to be so invested that to not even see that what is happening is a good thing. Like that's messed up. So what happens? She looks back longingly in verse 26 and she became a pillar of salt. She became a salt shaker. <laughs> I think that's literal. I think that's a literal pillar of salt. 
That's crazy, right? Like that's like a crazy Bible story. Like that's, that's, that's not quite the end of the story, but it's like, I mean, roll credits. You know what I mean? That's a bummer to become a salt shaker. Verse 27. <laughs> and then Abraham, he got up early in the morning. Remember, uh, the city was destroyed in the morning. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Again, there's a cool thing here. Side note, Abraham, he seeks the Lord early. It's like, a, like an Easter egg of Abraham. He got up early in the morning where he stood before the Lord and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the city went up as the smoke of a furnace. Assault and battery, you might say. Sorry, I'm gonna be a dad. So I'm getting the reps in. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. And when he overthrew the cities which, in which Lot dwelt, and Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. Finally, right, it only takes the actual destroying of the city and the plains and all that stuff. He's like, okay, fine, I'll go to the mountain. Did he get eaten by bears? No. Made it, and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar. Got a little hot. And he dwelt in the cave, and he and his two daughters. The story goes on, it gets even more bleak, where his daughters say, man, there's no hope in this. We're in a cave, we're in the middle of nowhere. We got nothing. There's no one, no husbands around. So let's get our dad drunk. And then gets the dad drunk, gets Lot drunk, and then they have sex, have a kid, whole mess of things. It's a bit of a domino effect that happens. And where did it start? It started with Lot taking his family down into Sodom and Gomorrah. He trusted in what he saw with his eyes. He trusted in what his flesh was calling out for him to do. And we need to what? Trust in the Lord. Let's go to Proverbs chapter three. A famous verse, Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six. It might be the most famous verse in the Bible. One of them. For sure. A lot of you guys have this memorized, right? Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all of thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Trust, trust, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. I have a couple points. We're gonna break this verse down. It's pretty simple. Point number one, trust in the Lord. Just like it says. Now the word trust in the Hebrew Bible, I'm gonna nail this, ready? It's betach. <laughs> trust. It means to trust and to have confidence and to be secure. But the word trust, this, this kind of Hebrew word trust, in the New Testament, in the Greek translation, we kind of get our word believe. It's a similar definition of terms, right? Uh, think of John 3.16. If this isn't the most, John 3.16 is like the Bible verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, what? Believe on him. That's, that's the believe that I'm talking about. Another one is Romans 10.9. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, then we will be saved. That's the believe. And the believe uh, is, is not just believe in something, right? Because question, does the devil believe in God? Yeah, I'm gonna say, yeah. He believes that he is a thing. But does he place confidence 
does he have faith in? Does he commit? Does he entrust his all in all? No, absolutely not, right? He believes that he's real, but you can see where the translation gets a little bit, you know, it can mean a couple different things for you. But believe. Back to the Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Believe in the Lord with all of your heart. There was a, a, a traveler who was a bit of a collector of like antiques and stuff like that. He lived in New York. And then he went uh, into a, uh, a place in Philadelphia, antique shop, found it. Uh, really cool little, you know, doing some picking, right? And he found this really cool old uh, uh, a barometer that was like vintage, you know, from like the 30s and kind of gold and really, really cool. So he took it home. Uh, uh, and then in the car, it kind of fell over a few times. You know, it's like, you know, it's sort of antique. It's, it's fine, you know. So he took it home, set it on a shelf. And, and when he looked, he saw that it said, uh, a hurricane is going to come. He's like, oh, no, I dropped it a few times. And uh, uh, I wonder if I can get a return on this. So he, he, he called up the place and they said, yeah, you, you, can, you can drive back and, um, you know, we can do it tomorrow. So he goes off to work comes back and, and his barometer's gone along with his house. A hurricane came. Uh, he didn't trust in the, uh, the barometer. Do you trust in the Lord? Do you trust in the Lord's promises? That's something to say, um, but it, it can be tough to do with all of your heart, which brings me to point number two. Trust in the Lord, point number two, with all of your heart. Now, I note that it doesn't say with all of your mind, right? I think of the Twilight Zone, mind. <sighs> Trusting the Lord in my mind can be pretty easy, right? You know the word, you know what it says? Yeah, trust in the Lord with all your heart. John three sixteen, Romans 10, 9. But in terms of, of, of your heart, do you trust in the Lord with all of your heart? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do you trust the Lord in your, in your heart? Or is your treasure in something else? Is it in your, in your, in your hobbies? Is it in, is it in your, your friend group? Is it in something? For Lot, his trust was in the city of Sodom. His trust was, was where he was at. It was not in the Lord. Because if you're putting a lot of time into something, time is what? Time is money. Fleeting too. But time is money. Money, there where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's a little bit of a reach, but you guys know what I'm saying. Where it's like, if you're investing in your, I'm gonna use golf because I don't like golf. <laughs> if you're working on your swing, you have a, a tea time of 7.30 a.m., right? That's an early day, but hey, it's tea time, you know? And then you do your eight, you, your holes or whatever. Nine if you gotta go, but you're, no, 18, gotta get my full thing in, you know? And then you go uh, to the 19th hole and get an Arnold Palmer and talk about how you did and how good you did and all that stuff and what you missed and how golf things, whatever. <laughs> but that's a lot of time. And then you come home and it's, you know, 8 p.m., 9 p.m., whatever it is, all day thing. Kids are asleep, wife's in bed, and you're wondering why the marriage isn't going good, you know. I'm painting a picture that's a little dramatic, but man, if you're not careful, that can happen pretty quickly, especially to you married people. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Point number three, our own understanding is very, very limited. You think you know something and then, you know, gone, totally wrong. Okay, can anyone tell me what Betsy Ross is famous for? Quick, quick, quick. The flag? No, not the flag, right? Isn't she women's rights? Can I get a thing, right? Okay, I'm going off the cuff. That's what I can get but you think you know something and then you look like an idiot in front of a thousand people. 
Lean not on your own understanding, right? Who was the gal that did the flag? Was it Betsy Ross? Dang. There you go. Look like an idiot. Lean not on your understanding. Did you guys hear about the... Did you, <laughs> oh, goodness. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Do you guys trust, like, companies these days? Did you guys see the Boeing thing that happened the other day? How many of you guys heard of the Boeing thing? It's a little bit scary. Which one, dude? Okay. <laughs> Easy there. You're going to get a shirt about it. I know it. Right? That'd be a good shirt, though. There was a thing where there's a whistleblower, and, and all of a sudden he kind of like went missing, you know? It's kind of sketchy. Look into it. Lean not on your own understanding. What do we understand? Do you guys remember uh, Coast to Coast with Art Bell? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A little excited about that one. That was, a, that was a fun radio show, right? Where, where if, you, if you guys didn't know about Coast to Coast, it, was, it started at like 10 p.m. Late, right? Late. It was like a late radio show. Started at like 10 p.m. And you would have the whole spectrum of people on there. You'd have like politicians that were like talking about some, some corruption that they were like, hey, this is legit. And then like the next minute, you'd have this guy that was like, I was abducted by aliens, <laughs> right? Right? Like that was coast to coast. <laughs> and it was, just, it was just a good time, right? <laughs> the modern version of, and I don't necessarily recommend this, but I kind of am, you know? How many of you guys have heard of blurry creatures? Raise your hand. Yeah, you know. You know what I mean. Okay, it's the modern coast to coast. Trust me. Blurry creatures. And on blurry creatures, it's, it is biblically based. Like they'll, they'll talk. Here's... Okay, here's the spectrum. You know, you have the cool thing and you have the crazy thing, right? They'll do the cool thing where they're like, yeah, the Nephilim. And then you kind of go like, all right, they're getting into it. The Nephilim, Genesis chapter six, here we go. And then like the next guest on is like, Bigfoot is real. I saw him. And then they'll, like, they'll make like a good argument. And then all of a sudden you're like supporting Bigfoot, you know? <laughs> what do we really know? You're not going to find it in blurry creatures. I'll tell you that. Lean not on your own understanding. God is creative. He works in a different way. He makes things like Nephilim, right? And maybe Bigfoot. Probably not, but maybe. To do things. You don't know what's going on, right? Right? When you lean on your own understanding, you find yourself in a pit. You find yourself in Sodom with your family with you. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean on the Lord. And in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And that's not like a, a in the Greek, all means, you know, it's all, right? All, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Now the word acknowledge, it's kind of a fun one, yada. As in like yada, yada, yada. It's to, no, it is, right? To know, to be acquainted with. Be acquainted with the ways of the Lord. Ephesians 3.20, he will bless you more than you know, but you'll have to have trust in, in the Lord. If you know the Lord, how do you know the Lord? How can you know? Here's, here's a little leading question. How can you know what the Lord is thinking? The word. The word, the word, right? You can get saved in an amazing way uh, without the word, with the Lord striking you, saying, you gotta get out of this city, grabbing you, throwing you, in amazing ways. But the excuse saying the Lord didn't do that, the Lord didn't strike lightning and, and do, is very, very foolish because the Lord is speaking volumes to you and I right now. Young people, I'm going to say 50 and younger. I'm kind of kidding. 30 and younger. Specifically, you guys and gals that, are, that are, are on Instagram, TikTok, doing that kind of thing, please be careful. Of, there's, something, there's, a, there's a couple trends to be careful. There's a lot of stuff to be careful about. One of those things is 
is the diminishing of the word of the Lord, the value of the word of the Lord. Have you guys seen this? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Um, there is a church, a local church, that, that, that gave a manifesto on what they think of uh, church operations and, and roles in the church, women's, specifically women's roles in the church. And in, par- oh boy. in paragraph one, sentence two, basically, it says that we don't believe that the word is any sort of handbook on how to do church. That's basically a direct quote as well. That is a popular, a, a, I shouldn't say popular, that is an opinion that is gaining steam, right? In that Paul didn't have the word of the Lord referring to the Bible, which is not true, right? He had the Old Testament and he kind of wrote a lot of the New Testament. Um, but the Lord used him, that's true. But the Lord is doing a thing in his word right now. And as for, to quickly, sorry, I got to address it. To quickly address, is, is the Bible a handbook on how to do church? Yeah, of course. Read the book of 1 Timothy, read 2 Timothy, read Titus for roles of men, for roles of women in the church. Read 1st, 2 Corinthians on like, stuff starts going a little sideways. 1 Corinthians, right? The book of Acts, the story, the, how the church got formed, what we should model, the model of the New Testament church, modeling the church. So not only is it a, a good way to go as far as a handbook on how, it's the handbook. It's the way to go. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, trust the word, lean into the word. And then what'll happen? Oh, dropped it. He will direct your path. This is gonna be a result of the first four. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Lean not on your understanding. And then what'll happen? He'll direct your path. That's one of the number one questions that the pastoral staff gets at Athey Creek. You know, what should I do about this thing specifically? To paint with a broad brush, you know? What do I do? As you like lay out all the college acceptance letters and kind of do like a Ouija board thing, you know? What do I do? Trust in the Lord. And then he's gonna direct your path. Acknowledge him in all your ways. And then then he's gonna direct your path. Do that with all of your heart and he's gonna direct your path. That's right. (laughs) Your own heart. (laughs) He's gonna direct your path. So you need wisdom, you need direction, trust him. And you're not gonna be ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. I, I, I have a feeling that, that if Lot were to take some of this in, if he were to have, have sought the Lord, uh, the way that Abraham was seeking the Lord on the somewhat regular basis, that he wouldn't have led his pam, family down a path of destruction, out of a path of uh, just chaos that literally ended in his family um, in a cave as a pillar of salt. It's a bummer. And you see that. If you've been around the church long enough, if you've seen um, people that kind of uh, check out of athe, of whatever church you've been a part of previously, uh, you've seen that, you know, people that were once walking with the Lord and, you know, ah, so Sunday is pretty busy and there's the game and then there's the thing and I got to do that. That's kind of lifting up your eyes and seeing Sodom looks pretty good over there. And before long, your family will be just in sh- just shambles. And it's so sad to see. I feel like Wednesday nights, I'm, I, it's a preaching to the choir kind of moment. You know what I mean? Where you guys, you gals, you're here, you're studying the word. I, I have an awesome feeling that, that you are trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, leaning not on your own understanding and in all of your ways, acknowledging him. And I pray that the Lord directs us. I pray that the Lord directs Athey Creek uh, in his ways and not our ways that he can make our path straight. Amen? Amen. Lord, we, we do pray this in, that you direct us, that you guide us, that you lead us. The world can, can, can dangle uh, the carrots in front of us, things that, that look amazing, attractive, whatever it may be. Um, 
but we know it just, it, it leads us into destruction. Wide is the path, broad is the path to destruction, Lord, but lead us in your way, your narrow way to righteousness. Lord, if you can save Lot, we know that you've saved us. And that's something that's worth singing about. It's something that's worth spending a Wednesday night to, to, to glean, to hear from, to hear from you. So as we go our way, would you remind us, uh, uh, the new Christians in here, the seasoned Christians in here, would you remind us to trust in you in, in everything that we're doing, not leaning on our own understanding uh, that you would direct us, Father. Help us to listen to you in Jesus' name. Amen.